If you are struggling to learn your Canon R6 Mark II, you are in the right place. In this video, we're going to cover the operation of the camera only. I'm gonna show you the buttons and controls, what the icons mean, how to change your exposure settings, focusing, we're gonna talk about the metering mode, we're gonna talk about the drive modes, we're gonna talk about the quick menu. My name is Michael Andrew, I'm going to be your host and instructor for about the next two hours. If you are a pure beginner, or even an intermediate shooter, I would strongly recommend watching this video from start to finish. If you are an experienced user and you wanna jump around the chapters, take advantage of the table of contents. We've spent a lot of time putting this together. You're going to hit Control F or Command F, type in the topic that you're interested in. We have a chapter marker for it. It should be highlighted and then you'll be able to click on the time code and it should take you directly to this chapter. This video is brought to you by Maven filters. This is a magnetic filter line I just created this year. We had a fantastic Kickstarter and these are going to be available within the next couple months, hopefully even retail. So if you get into landscape photography or if you need a CPL, circular polarizer, definitely check out my color-coded magnetic filters. They are a game changer for ease of use. Another fantastic resource I want to offer is my Facebook group. I'll put that link in the description. This is for R5, R6, and R6 Mark II users. We have a great community of over 15,000 users. We would love to see your images and give you feedback. Definitely check that out. In addition to this video, I also create crash course videos that show you the complete operation of the camera inside and out in real world shooting situations. Things like sports and landscape, portraits. We do focus stacking, time lapse, video, all kinds of techniques and methods. Speaking from experience, because I learned on my own, it took me about two years to really learn my first camera. The cameras we have now are far more advanced. So you're probably looking at taking two to three years off of the learning curve by investing in yourself into the Canon R6 Mark II crash course. If you're interested in that course, check out the link below. If it's not ready, it'll take you to my blog. You leave your name and your email address. There's no obligation. We don't share your information. We just want to see who's interested. And if there's enough interest, we go into the full production. It takes about six to eight weeks to create those courses. And if there's demand, I will definitely do that kind of a course. The crash courses even cover things like the basics of photography. So if you're a pure beginner, strongly, strongly recommend that course. In any event, we have a huge, a huge amount of information to cover. So let's get started. Our tripod will allow us to put different kinds of mounts on here. I prefer the ball head and there's different versions of this. Bogan Manfrotto makes some really good stuff. There's a number of companies that do, but this is just the one that I've been recommending because it's affordable and it's pretty reliable. This little plate in this particular one that I like, I'll put the link in the description in terms of which tripod I like. I like it because it snaps in and then you can start shooting and it's pretty quick to undo it. This is referred to as a shoe. You're gonna notice that we have this little mount hole on the bottom, so we're gonna, we're gonna thread this into the camera to allow us to put it onto the tripod ball head. And this is the beauty of a, of a professional tripod is that you can put different types of accessories on top, and, but if you're just shooting in the beginning, this is what it, what it looks like. So it's locked down, and I could take this and move it around in different directions. You're going to notice you have a notch right here. I get a metallic Sharpie pen, and you don't have to do this, but it just makes it easier to do something like that because black on black, there's no contrast. But here, I can see where that mark is, and it just makes it just a little bit easier for me to put the cap on and off. There is a corresponding red mark on the lens mount. This is where we attach our lenses. So I know that when those are lined up, it'll shut like this. And then something I'll also do is I'll also put it on the back cap because it's much easier to align. So I'll just write straight on it. Just makes it a lot easier to see. So when we're putting a lens onto our RF mount, we're gonna take the cap off. I'm also gonna take the cap off the back of the lens. There's the red mark. We're gonna line up the red mark to the red mark, and we're gonna rotate it until we hear it click. Now when we take the lens off, we're gonna reverse this. Push and hold the lens release down, and I'm gonna rotate it counterclockwise, and it comes off. Now, a word of warning is that when you're making lens changes, you want to minimize the amount of time that this is open. And I would recommend facing this down whenever you can. We live in a microbe world. There's little particles and dust flying, flying around in the air that we can't see. And so another recommendation is don't change this in a windy environment. If you're outside and it's windy, 
try to find a better place to do it in your car, you know, maybe behind a tree or something where there's no wind, because that wind can carry particles into our sensor. One of the great things about Canon cameras now is that when you turn them off, they'll have the shutter close. Now on the crash course, I'll demonstrate how to clean the sensor. It's very easy, it's very straightforward, but just be careful when you're changing this, have good lens changing hygiene, point this down when you're changing the lens, try not to do it in a windy environment. For the most part, you're gonna be good. At some point, you will need to clean your sensor. So for now, we're just gonna put this back on. While we are on the topic of lenses, this is an RF lens connecting to an RF mount. Canon has a huge number of EF lenses from the previous DSLR cameras. They're slowly phasing out. Some of these lenses are really good and you can get an adapter. This one has a control ring built onto it. It's about $199. They make one without the control ring built in for about $100, which would allow you to adapt older EF Canon lenses onto your new RF mount. Something that's cool about the RF lenses, you can't really see it because of the angle, is there's going to be a control ring built into most of these lenses and those control rings are customizable. I have a buddy who uses it almost exclusively for either white balance or ISO depending on how he's shooting. And that's one of the key differences between the RF lenses which are designed for the mirrorless Canon cameras. The EF lenses are made for DSLRs. You can still make them work but you would need an adapter. You currently cannot take an RF lens and put it onto an EF mount camera. Something else I wanna point out is Many of you know, uh, Maven is a filter company. We get a lot of questions about how do you find the filter thread size for our camera. You just look under the lens cap. You just look under here. I can see that it says 43 millimeters. That tells me that this lens thread here is 43 millimeters and it would accept 43 millimeter filters. And we actually make filters in this lens size. It's the same size for the 16 millimeter RF. These are both great affordable lenses. The 50 millimeter 1.8 and the 16 millimeter 2.8. They're both great, low cost, high quality lenses that you would probably want to take a look at if you're on a budget. Something else you'll notice is that some lenses will just have it listed on the lens, either on the rim or sometimes on the back of the lens somewhere. When we're talking about the battery, there is a new type of Canon battery that is the LPE6NH. I personally almost always use exclusively Canon branded batteries, but I know some users. You know, they're, they're expensive, they're 70, $80, sometimes they're hard to find. There are some users who will need to shoot all day, so they need five or six batteries. So there are some off-brand batteries out there. I just don't particularly like them. But you'll see that we have these notches here. And to open the battery compartment, obviously we're just gonna go like this, and you can see the shape of it. So the pins are towards the camera itself on the inside. Something you'll notice is that we get these little icons down here, and this is a battery icon, and this is a grip icon. And what that means is that there will be a battery grip available for the R6. Kind of hard to see, but if you look right here, there's a little pin and there's a spring-loaded lever here that when we push this to the side, we can take this out. And this will allow us to insert a battery grip. The battery grip will hold two batteries. You'll get a lot longer shooting life. It typically has controls and, and shutter buttons on it so you can shoot vertically more comfortably. The Canon R7, which came out earlier this year, did not have a removable door, which told us that Canon had no intention of creating a battery grip for it. But this is how you take it out. You just slide this over, and then when you're ready to put it back, you're gonna feed it in, just like this, and let it catch again. This pin over here works with the battery grip. It's how it communicates with the camera. And so that's what that's all about. When you're ready to go, push and close it. If you're shooting for more than three or four, about three hours, I would definitely recommend having a backup battery. And in order to get the most out of the frames per second, talking about the 12 mechanical frames per second, you do need to have one of these new batteries. You will not get that same performance with the older Canon batteries. Let's talk about memory cards real quick. To insert memory cards, you're going to open this door and you get again some little etched diagrams. It has these corners cut off and those correlate with the corners of the cards themselves. So when you put them in, the notch is going to be up towards the top of the camera. Before we insert them, I wanted to point out a couple important things. You'll notice that I have two 128 gigabyte memory cards. They're made by SanDisk. They're called the Extreme Pros. This is what I typically use, but these are two completely different cards. You'll notice here, it's kind of hard to see. This says, this says 95 megabytes per second, and this says 300 megabytes per second. That deals with the read speed of the card. 
And when I flip them over, you're going to notice some physical differences. This has one set of pins and this has two sets of pins. Therefore, we know that this is a UHS-1 memory card and this is a UHS-2 memory card. UHS-2 memory cards are far faster and they're also a lot more expensive. I always tell my students, try to get the best memory card you can, whatever you can afford with UHS-2 that has the largest gigabyte size especially if you are a sports shooter and you're shooting hundreds or thousands of pictures every time you go out in your workflow this is going to make a huge difference when you're downloading and transferring images it's also going to allow the memory card to clear faster your buffer will clear, fa clear faster when you're shooting and you'll be able to get it back into the action so that those are the main differences but you'll also notice that we also have some of these symbols in here u3 class 10 this deals with sustained write speed for video. And for 4K video, you want the U3 symbol. It's not like you can find a memory card laying around your house and just throw it in. You know, if it's, if it's an old card, you're going to have video performance problems. So you want at minimum class U3. And if you get the UHS-2 cards, they typically are far outperforming the cheaper cards. So it also kind of depends on what kind of shooting you're doing. If you're doing landscapes or portraits where you're not shooting that many shots, probably going to be fine with the UHS-1 card. But let me show you how to put them in. I'm going to put this in slot 2, UHS-1 card, because it's a little slower. Then we'll put the fast card in here. You're going to push until you hear it click, and then you're ready to go and close the door. I also get a ton of questions about how to transfer uh, you know, images from the camera to your computer. The fastest way is to take the memory card out, put it into a card reader, plug it into your camera, at least right now. Hopefully in the future, there will be high-speed Wi-Fi transfer, but we're not there yet where it's super, super fast. So if you have a lot of images, take the card out, put it into your computer, and then download them. First thing I want to do in terms of lesson is to give you an overview of what these buttons and controls are, their names. Just briefly introduce you to them so as we get into the tutorial itself, you know what I'm talking about. This is your shutter button, obviously. Very important. It has two phases. The first is a halfway shutter depression. This engages our camera's focusing systems. It doesn't take the picture. It's almost like a spongy resistance. Train your finger to feel that difference. It's like a spongy resistance, and when you push it all the way down, just turn on, it takes a picture. So this is what it sounds like. Camera's focusing, you can hear a beep. Push it down all the way, camera takes the picture. This is going to be critical to train your finger to feel where that focus point is. And we'll talk about different focusing methods in this video. This little guy right here is a lamp that will turn on when you are using your timer. It will also turn on in low light situations to illuminate the area, helping the camera to focus. You'll notice that we have these two little holes in the camera. These are our built-in microphones for the camera. They're not really great, but they're better than nothing. If you're doing any kind of professional video recording, you're going to want to use an external microphone, either on the hot shoe mount, plugged into the camera on the side, or a lav mic. For these videos, I use a lavalier microphone because they're clearer, the sound and the audio is better. Kind of hard to see, but down here, we have a customizable button that by default, when you get it, it's typically set up for depth of field preview. I change this to toggle through my focusing clusters. Just know that you can control what this button does. Over here, we've already talked about it. We have the lens release. Taking a look at the side view of the camera, I put a 14 to 35 wide angle lens. You'll notice that we have these different switches. If your camera stops focusing suddenly, there's a 95% chance that you did this. You just bump this switch over. This stands for autofocus, manual focus. So when you're handling the lens, sometimes that will, that will happen. You'll just bump it. and So just be aware of that. If your camera stops focusing, you probably mishandled the switch. We also have the ability to turn off, in this case, the stabilizer. The stabilizer is the image stabilization built into the lens, but also built into the camera body. So when you turn this off, it should turn it off all together, both of them. When you have a stabilized lens that works well with the in-body image stabilization, you can get some amazing, amazing shots, even hand holding the camera. That's a discussion for another lesson. Just know there's some control switch on the side of the lenses. 
On the left side of the camera, we have these rubber gaskets. You can see little labels, mic, this is a headset, this is a remote USB and HDMI. So this is the microphone port. Here it is. If we're using an external microphone, this is where we would plug it in. And if you're doing any kind of serious video work, you will definitely need a good high quality microphone. The one below it, we have the headset icon. This allows us to listen to the audio as we are recording. Highly recommended that you do that. Sometimes you'll get interference or your microphone is broken, and this will allow you to catch it before you, know, you record a bunch of stuff. Underneath here, we have a remote terminal, things like intervalometers or remote switches that allow us to control the camera by our wired remote. And then you'll notice we have this notch here to pull out. We have our USB C terminal and our HDMI out. One of the key differences of this terminal, it's still small, but this should support 6K out to an Atomos Ninja recorder. They haven't updated the firmware or the software to allow you to do this. Just know that it's probably coming. So these are the ports, very useful for shooting video, if you're using microphones and headsets. And many people ask about charging with your USB-C cable from a battery pack. Canon has an accessory that allows you to plug it into the wall and then plug it in here. You'll see a little charge lamp. If it's just a plain battery pack, it doesn't appear to be working. I think this is a power requirement, but Canon is also very finicky and touchy about non-Canon accessories being used with their camera. So they try to create these things where you have to buy more of their accessories. But yes, you can charge your camera. It just, if you look in the manual, it requires a special adapter. And I know there are workarounds that people have made and published, so I'll just leave it at that. When we look at an overhead view of the camera, obviously we have our power switch, super important. We have this new position called lock, which locks the camera settings, and we can typically customize which features are locked. But we also have it in the full on position, which is also the unlocked. One of the key differences between the R6 Mark II and the original R6 is now we have a dedicated stills to video switch here on the left side. In terms of external buttons, this is an upgrade, I believe, because it allows us to jump into videos or stills back and forth pretty quickly. The mode dial, we'll be talking about this in depth. This controls how the camera helps us. It's how much help the camera is going to give us. If you're a pure, pure beginner, the green box is the dummy mode. I typically like beginners shooting on P or AV mode. We'll talk about this in depth a little bit later. This rolling control wheel right here is super important. And I like to refer to this as your primary selector. Primary, index finger one. So your index finger, number one, is going to be on the primary selector. It changes the primary setting of the mode that you are shooting in. And back here, your thumb is going to rotate another wheel. And I like to call this the secondary selector, but I'll talk about why when we cover exposure control and exposure compensation. Next to the shutter button, just behind it, we have something called the MFN button or the multifunction button. It's very useful for jumping through different secondary settings, things like focusing, ISO, white balance. Talk about that in depth. We also have the video record button, which if you push this, it should start and stop video recording. This will be indicated by a little red circle on the back of your monitor. And of course we have our strap mounts on the top sides. Real quick, I wanted to talk about the hot shoe mount. It's on top of your camera. And there's this little protector that Canon has, has put in here. And if you look carefully up towards the top here in there, you're going to see some terminal pins. So that what's happening is, is Canon's putting this little protector in there to pr protect the pins. But the problem is, is this cover is, is sometimes it'll stick. It's not exactly easy to get out. These pins here will allow you to use different kinds of accessories, including flash units. There's a new microphone that works really good. It's integrated wiring, so you don't have to plug the microphone into the side. But suffice it to say, this is your hot shoe mount. You can also put other accessories on here like a non-pin compatible microphone or a video light, things of that nature. And that's what this is all about. We cover flash use in the crash course that we make for these cameras, just like an introduction to flash use. It's like a, about an hour part of the course and it'll teach you the basics to get you started. When we're talking about the back of the camera, there is a lot going on. Something I wanna point out real quick 
is this little dial here on the side. This is referred to as the diopter adjustment, and this will control the focus of the EVF, which is the electronic viewfinder. It's a little TV in a mirrorless camera. DSLR has allowed us to look through a prism that bounced down and actually view through the lens in real time. That's not how mirrorless cameras work. We get a little TV monitor. It's going to give us exposure preview, but I wear corrective eyewear, and so I need to adjust this in order to see it clearly. Just below that, you'll see this little six dot item here. That is a little built-in speaker for the camera when you're playing back videos. In the top left-hand corner, we have a rate button, which allows us to add a rating to our images. And we have our deep menu button. There's a ton of information in the deep menu. On the back of the camera, as we grip it, we have our auto focus on. This is great for back button focusing. It's also good to set up this little star icon to eye detection. It's typically what I do. So you can get different kinds of back button focusing depending on how you customize this. The star button by default is going to lock your exposure settings. Or if you're using a flash, it will lock your flash exposure settings. So this locks the camera's shutter speed and aperture so it doesn't change and you can take a picture. This little guy here on the far right, it looks like a little box with some tick marks in it. I like to call it the focus cluster selector. By default, when you select this, it will allow you to toggle through the different types of focusing clusters. This guy here, the joystick, super important. It's going to be used for moving your focusing square around as you look through the viewfinder. And if you push it into the camera body, it will reset the focusing square to the center of the screen. Below that, we have the magnifying glass, which will allow us to zoom in on images as well as zoom in while we are shooting, especially in manual. This is super useful. We can get precise focus using manual focusing in a zoom technique that I will demonstrate. Pushing the info button repeatedly will allow us to cycle through different kinds of information. And then we have the Q button. Quick menu will allow us to set up different types of shutter speed, aperture, secondary controls. I'll demonstrate that in just a moment. Back here, we have the multi-selector, or the multi-control wheel. And you can see that it rotates to the left or right. In the middle, we have a set button. It's sort of like a return or an enter button. And I'll be demonstrating how this works in different aspects. Something that you'll notice is that Canon has redundancies where you can use different controls to do different things. So you might use the joystick and also be able to control for example, net menu navigation using the primary or the secondary selector, multi-control wheel, just comes down to preference. On the bottom, we have the playback button, obviously for playing back images. We also have the delete or the garbage can icon, which will allow us to delete images. This little lamp here, you'll see it turn red. This is writing to the memory card. When it's um, buffering or caching, you'll also see this flashing in red. And this is something to be aware of. If we were to come in and start video recording, you can see that it's also flashing. When I am traveling, I typically have my monitor facing the camera just for abrasive protection. I almost always put a screen on as soon as I get it. Sometimes they're not available, but I'll put a plastic screen on this. And I'm going to rotate the monitor and flip it back around to point out a couple important things. This little window just below the EVF, if you put it up to your face or a finger or as you're handling the camera, you'll notice that it's turning the back monitor off. This is a power saving feature. And the idea behind it is that as you look through the viewfinder, EVF, let's save this battery power. And there's different ways to customize this as well. It comes in handy when you're shooting video on a gimbal. Some gimbals will have mounts here. So in the yellow menu, you can set this up in different ways. You can turn it off. Just be aware of that that this is what's happening. This back monitor is also touch sensitive. So if we were to play the images, here we can see some images I just took in Africa, in the Masamara. We were on a conservancy. We, we watched a pride of lions literally have dinner. It was crazy. But I want, I'm doing this to demonstrate how we can use the touch screen to swipe left and right. You're used to this already, you know, with your smartphones that you can scroll through things. It, this was crazy seeing this. We, I mean, we were as close as like 20 feet from it. Another thing you can do is that you can pinch in towards the camera and you can see that we're zooming out. And this gives us a thumbnail preview. So we can scroll through these. Let's take a look at 
What's going on here? More fading. Okay, this is a good picture. So we can also zoom in using the magnifying button. Look at that. Just insane. It was an insane experience. Wild. Or we can just zoom in with pinching. Very quick, very intuitive. When we're in the deep menu section, for example, we can also touch. I think this is the fastest way to navigate is just to come in and you see I'm pushing, pushing the menu button to jump out. The, the touch screen is a very useful. We'll use it for focusing. We'll use it for a number of different ways. This really revolutionized how we operate large cameras. It's been around for several years now. Most camera companies have some sort of touch monitor on the back screen. I want to take you on a tour of the back monitor. So the camera's on, but it's gone into sleep mode. So to wake it up, you can tap the shutter button. It takes just a moment to wake up. I'm going to come into the deep menu real quick, and I'm going to turn off this battery saving feature. So it's on page three, coming into power saving. Screen dimmer, we're just going to disable this for now. I wouldn't recommend doing this for you, but I'm going to do it because I'm teaching right now. One of the most common questions that I get, let me take this cap off. Obviously, we, we got some things going on. You can see my shadow. We got uh, auto exposure. We're on P mode. Let's just flip this over to, oh my goodness. Do you see what's happening here? Where we have, every time we turn the mode dial, we're going to get these prompts. And I'm not a huge fan of this because it takes us away from shooting. So we want to turn this off. We're going to come into the menu. We're going to go to mode guide and we're going to turn this off feature guide same idea we'll have it pop up but this is where you'd also turn this off so now when we change the mode dial we're, we're basically still in a shooting mode these blinds are very famous they've been in almost all of my videos probably the world's most famous blinds Pump this up a little bit but let's set up the date and time if you haven't already you're going to come into Date and time on the bottom. We're going to set this up real quick. Today is the fourth. It is, I wake up kind of early to do these videos. I don't know. It's just peaceful and relaxing. I, and you know what? I do it for fun sometimes. It's like, I don't feel like this is work. I just like making videos that help people. Turn it to Honolulu. So be sure that when you, once you set this up, that you press OK to get out of the menu, otherwise it won't save it. Set up your date and time, very important. And when you change time zones, probably pretty important to change those time zones as well, you do so here. It just puts the date and the time into your EXIF data of your files as you're shooting. As we start getting into the functions of the camera, I just want to encourage you to please be patient with yourself. Don't be hard on yourself. This is a learning process. It's going to take some time. Be kind to yourself as you're learning these things. It took me two years, way back in 2003, to learn how to use a camera. And I make these videos to save you time, but there's still a huge learning curve. What I want you to do is to get your camera in hand, turn it on, and just push the info button. Just do this. And what this does is it cycles through different types of shooting information. There's several different screens. We have a level here with a histogram. See that? Now there's no information. Now we have what I call the black screen or the Q screen, quick menu screen. And then we have like these hybrids. And the reason I say this is because I get a lot of questions. Hey, what happened to the quick menu screen? Or hey, I'm in the quick menu screen, I can't get out of it. And that's why you should get used to toggling the info button. Just get used to that. I'm gonna flip this over to manual, show you a couple things. In the top left-hand corner here, this is going to tell us which mode we are shooting in. And I'm shooting in the manual mode for a very specific reason, is to go through all these settings. There are three settings you should always keep your eye open for, and these are on the bottom. When you see a fraction, like 1 125th of a second, this is dealing with our shutter speed. Shutter speed is the length of time that the shutter is exposing the sensor. It's how long in seconds, does it, does it let light in? In this case, it would be 1 125th of a second, fairly quick, right? In, in regards to full seconds. Next to it, you will also see a number that typically has the letter F. The letter F designates the aperture. 
which is the size of the opening. It's, it's basically the hole of the lens. Now, different lenses will have different sized openings. It's something it's kind of fun to do is just to take a lens and open the back cap and just take a look to see how big that opening is. This is going to be the maximum aperture of the lens. Some of them are relatively large. Some of them, like the cheaper kit lenses, they're relatively small. And it really depends on the lens. This is the 24 to 105. This is a great lens. But the aperture is a ratio between the focal length of the lens, which is how far away from the sensor is the primary lens element, divided by the opening of the lens. It's a ratio. And so what this means is, is that as we change our f-stop, if I'm going to change this, something else I want to point out is you will notice that we get these little orange icons. This is like a orange half moon icon. That's your primary selector. It's telling us which selector will change it. And then when we see this full circle, this is the rear control wheel. Also will tell us how to change it. And then we get a, a lower crescent moon for our ISO. So we can change our ISO if we wanted to. We'll talk about that in a second. But in regards to apertures, the lower the number aperture, so if we're shooting at f2, for example, that is a very wide opening. This lens won't go that wide open, it goes to f4. Very, very wide opening. As we change this number to become a larger f-stop number, the opening gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So very high f numbers, very small opening, very low numbers, like f4, very large openings. It, it's inverted, but suffice it to say that these two items, you're going to see these as you look through the viewfinder, you're gonna see them in a number of different places. This is what controls the amount of light entering the camera, nothing else. Now there is this setting over here called ISO. I will give some demonstrations on this when we get into the exposure lesson. It's easiest to think of your ISO control as an artificial boost. So what this does is it replaces the film speeds that we used to have. So films would have different sensitivities. So 400 is like standard practice outside. But if you were shooting in low light situations, you would typically try to use a film that was more sensitive. And this is the digital equivalent of that is where we can boost the signal of the light coming in. And it's the equivalent of using more or less sensitive film stocks. But these three settings here are going to control the brightness of your image. When we press the info button a couple times, you can see that we'll also see these settings in the quick screen or the black screen. We have our mode that we're shooting in. We have our shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. So what I wanna do now is, is to try to walk you through these icons so you become familiar with them and this isn't confusing. To a pure beginner, this is absolutely confusing because these are all new icons and symbols and you have no idea you know what they mean so let's walk through the icons and then we'll, we'll get into the camera operation itself just below the shutter speed and the aperture we have a bracket here and this is the exposure compensation bracket the word exposure is a fancy way to say brightness so when we're saying brightness compensation this feature allows us to tell the camera whether to make the image a little darker or a little bit brighter and I'll be covering that when we cover the exposure compensation lesson. Just below that, we have this guy, which is our picture styles. And we can select our picture styles. We can select any of these by pressing the Q button. You get this orange highlight. We can press on the monitor. And you can see how it's saying adjust the app. It's trying to tell us how these things work. It's trying to give us a prompt. So this is the feature guide. And I'm going to turn it off because it gets in my way. I'm going to explain this to you in normal human language. But suffice it to say that when you want to change using your touch screen, you're going to have to press the Q button here on the, or the Q button here. They do the same thing. We get an orange highlight. We can tap on it and we can touch and drag. We can do this direct. We can use these buttons on the side, turn to the menu. We can also rotate one of our control wheels while it's highlighted. So you can see Canon has built in a lot of redundancy in terms of changing the various settings. So we have our exposure compensation next to it is the flash exposure compensation. 
exposure is brightness, right? So this says flash brightness compensation. And you'll notice that there were some bars there to the left or right. This is darker and this is brighter. So what this is telling us is that we can change the brightness of our flash by moving this to the left and right. We know that flash exposure compensation is different because we see this little lightning bolt right there just to the left of that plus and minus. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Coming over to this item, this guy here, this little camera icon, back, I keep bumping it. The back of the camera is going to allow us to customize buttons and dials. In the beginning, I would say don't worry about this until you get a hang of what you're doing, probably intermediate, advanced intermediate types of shooters. That's the time to start tweaking these. I'm going to teach you the camera by default. Here we have our picture styles. The easiest way to think of these is to imagine them as recipes that is taking different kinds of information and creating JPEGs. In here, we can tweak and designate different kinds of settings such as sharpness, hue, contrast. It's a little bit more advanced. That's what all these icons mean. If we come in here and we go to info, detail set, we can scroll through these and it will tell us different types of settings that we can shift and change. In the beginning, I would say turn this to auto or standard. Don't worry about it. For now, just simply do not worry about this. It will become more important if you do video shooting and you want to tweak the look of it in camera. Suffice it to say, for example, portrait picture style is more accurate for flesh tones. Landscapes, you can expect more vivid blues and greens. We have fine detail, neutral, faithful, monochrome. So they're just recipes that create JPEG images. Next, we have our white balance. We'll be talking about this later in the video. If you're a pure beginner, leave it on auto white balance. As you get more advanced, you're going to notice color things happening, and we'll talk about changing those a little bit later. This is the white balance shift in bracket. You can see this little grid over here for now. Don't worry about this. We'll talk about it at a later point. Next to this, we have our auto light optimizer. By default, it's disabled. This is a slight contrast bump to JPEG images. We can Come in here, oh, it's disabled for manual mode. Let me flip this over. Come in and you'll see that it's turned on. So don't worry about this too much for now. By default, just leave it on standard. This is going to control some of the contrast and optimization of the JPEG files themselves. We have our Wi-Fi settings. Canon's updated this recently. And if I have time, I'll show you this in another lesson. Next to that, we have our card slot selector. I have it on standard, which just lets me shoot on memory card one. We can switch the card here. So once it fills up, it'll go to slot two. Record separately. It's designed to allow us to record different size images to different cards. Doesn't really work for C-RAW or RAW. And then we can record copies to both cameras. I'm just gonna leave this on auto switch for now. Coming back out, we're gonna look down here on the bottom. This is our focus cluster selector. We can get there by also just pushing the cluster selector here. We also have this thing called the tracking enabler. It's kind of confusing because if it's on, it'll say enable, and if it's disabled, turned off, it'll say disable. It's kind of a little confusing there. Next to that, we have our focus mode. This is how the camera is focusing, whether it's a one time, a multiple time, or a hybrid, we'll be talking about this in the focusing lesson. And then we have our metering mode. Give you a demonstration a little bit later. This is how the camera measures light coming into the lens. We have our drive mode. This is how the camera behaves after we push a shutter button down all the way in regards to maybe a burst. So 12 mechanical frames per second or 40 frames per second, we'd want this high speed burst. We have a slower high speed burst, and then we have a low speed continuous burst. If I'm not mistaken, this is 12, this is like six, and this is three. This is just off the top of my mind. That seems about right. We have our 10 second timer, our two second timer. And we also have a continuous timer, which we can tell how many images do we want it to take. I'm rotating the primary selector. And so this uses a 10 second timer, but it'll also take multiple images. Great for family shots when you're worried about people blinking. Coming back out, it covers most of the Q screen stuff. Come back out here. We have a few icons on the bottom. This 
is the Q button for the back monitor. If we push that, we can come in. Then we have the battery life indicator. I have a fresh battery in here. Then we have our Wi-Fi indicator. It's grayed out. We have our image stabilization indicator. It's like a hand shaking. And then when you see numbers with brackets on them, this is telling us the number of shots remaining on the memory card that we currently are using. So I have 322 shots remaining. That will also be dependent on the quality that we're shooting in. I'm gonna come back to red tab. Red tab number one, image quality. You can see that I have smooth JPEG. We'll talk about this when we cover the menu portion of this. It'll probably be a separate video, but I can come in and select Jagged L. And what will happen is you'll notice that the file size doubles. This has to do with compression. So if you're trying to maximize the number of shots you can get in camera, speed up your workflow a little bit, I actually recommend shooting in Jagged L instead of Smooth L. When I first got started in photography, I did tons of tests between those two. It's almost impossible to see it with the naked eye, the differences. So this is the quick menu screen that we're in right now. We're gonna press the info button. And what I wanna demonstrate is that you already know a ton about your camera. I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna turn the exposure compensation down, I tap the shutter button to wake it up. And I just rotate this down because I want you to see the darker icons. So a lot of this stuff you already know. We have our mode, we have the number of shots remaining. When we see a number outside of the brackets, that's how many shots we would get in a burst. So if we're doing high speed shooting and saying we can get 99 shots before the camera buffer fills up and slows down, the time is telling how much video we could shoot at the current settings. We have our battery, image stabilization. We can do quick menu from here if we wanted to change these settings. I'll talk about this in just a second. So this is our touch shutter mode. So we can turn it off, we can turn it on. I don't really use this. I usually typically have the shutter turned off. And again, we have our aperture. We see our exposure compensation. And over here, we have our ISO. Above that, we have our focal length indicator. So as I change the focal length, you can see the focal length indicator changing. You might be asking what happened to the shutter speed. It's hidden right now. We'll talk about this when we cover exposure. There it is. It's a little hidden right now, and we can't change it directly. Something else I want to point out, here's our focusing square. It's pretty small, but as we move it, we get this indicator here. That is the recenter feature. You can also get there just by pushing the joystick into the camera body. So what I want to do now is cycle through the different kinds of information so you can see where these icons pop up. And holy cow, we get a bunch of these crazy guys right on the sides. Still cycling through. So what's happening is this is the Q. Oh, Turn this up a little bit. So if we push the Q button, either here or here, in this shooting mode, is we get many of those same features now listed on the sides. And the way this works is whatever is highlighted, its feature options will appear on the bottom of the screen. So this deals with the focusing clusters, and I can select between those clusters. I, I typically actually push, but I'll demonstrate this in another lesson in terms of what these are. I'm just trying to tell you how this works. So if we were to scroll down, and we go to one shot, which is our focusing mode, we see the options on the bottom. If we go to memory cards, we can select the quality that we're shooting in. If we press the info button, we can jump into which memory card we're recording to. And if we press set, we can jump into one of the RAWs, whether it's a full RAW or a compressed RAW. So keep an eye out for these little white prompts to tell you to change additional features for whatever we have highlighted in orange. As I continue to scroll down, we have our drive modes, right? And we can just rotate over, come down again. We have our metering modes. I'll demonstrate this in a moment. Continue to rotate. We can jump out of the menu. Let's return arrow. We have our flicker, anti-flicker shooting. This deals with sodium-based lamps, other kinds of lamps, they actually flicker. The human eye cannot see it. If we turn this on, the camera will analyze this and shoot in such a way that that lighting is consistent. We can push flicker detection to turn it on or off. For the most part, I actually leave this turned off unless I notice something where I can see it with my naked eye. It's, it's like a shifting color. Push this. We have our 
white balance. We have different kinds of auto white balance. I don't want to get too complex. You can leave it on either one of them. Fine for now. If we go to our info, we have our white balance shift and bracket. As we come down, we have our picture styles. We saw this before. These are the recipes that determine how JPEGs are created in regards to sharpness, saturation, contrast, things of that nature. Come back out. Here we have subject to detect is set to auto now, but if you look on the bottom, we have people, animals, vehicles, and we can ha also have none, turn it off. When it's on auto, the camera is going to do its best to try to figure out what you're shooting, whether it's a person or an animal, and it will try to detect their face or in sometimes their eyes. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. This greatly helps get focusing lock because when you're shooting animals or people, you want one of their eyes to be in focus. When you're shooting a vehicle, you want the cockpit or at least the front part of the car to be in focus. So these settings help us to achieve that where the camera is assisting us in focusing. Super powerful. I will demonstrate how to use eye detection and some of the other focusing techniques in just a little bit here. So we're going to select that. And then when we come down to the cropping of the aspect ratio, I leave it on full aspect because you can always crop later in post. I know some people who prefer to shoot in 16 by nine for stills. It's just what they like. Or if you're shooting for Instagram, you may want to shoot at a one by one. So if I take a picture at one by one, I'm going to flip the lens switch to manual. I'm a little bit close. When you play that back, you're going to get a square icon. So that's what the cropping does. If you're a pure beginner, I'd recommend just leaving it here for now. We can also shoot with a crop part of the frame at 1.6. If you want to shoot at APS-C, you're welcome to do so. There are reasons to do this occasionally, but in the beginning, stick to full frame. You'll notice that when I flipped the lens switch to manual focus, we get some of these things changing. The auto focus icons change to MF, and we also get a focusing guide on the bottom. If I rotate the focusing ring, it will tell us the distance in meters where the camera is actually focusing. It's kind of cool. We have our exposure simulation indicator, which means the camera is going to give us a preview of what we're about to shoot. If I'm not mistaken, that's most of them. If I push the info button again, now we get our level. And you'll notice that there's two parts to the level. There is the side to side. So if I tilt the camera one way or the other, we get these red arms. When it's horizontally level, it'll be green. And if we tilt the camera forward or backward, eventually we will get these inside indicators. In fact, let me see if I can do this real quick. Just tilt it up. So when the camera is completely level, it'll be green all the way across. When one of these are off, it'll indicate that. We also have our histogram, this guy here. The histogram is a statistical tool that will tell you how over or underexposed your image is when you have an even exposure the peaks will be between these frames. If you're overexposed, the peak will be cut off on this side. If, it's too, if you have lots of darks or shadows, it'll be cut off on this side. Pressing the info button again, we have our, our no indicator screen. And that, ladies and gentlemen, are the symbols and icons that you will see on your back monitor. I know it's a lot of information. It's worth taking the time to repeat as necessary just to become familiar with what they are. A couple of things I want to point out is that when we go into the video mode, flip this over, you'll notice that some of this information changes. We get a little cropping of the top and the bottom of the monitor. And this is a 16 by nine ratio, which is typically what you'll see in video cameras. If I push the info button, you'll notice that we see a number of other items have changed. I'm going to turn this over to manual. We still have our shutter speed, our aperture, and our ISO for video, but now we have our record levels, which is really cool. The record levels, what you want to be careful of is to make sure that these do not go in the red. So if I snap my fingers and you see that red, that means that audio is clipping out. We're losing some of that signal. So what we can do is we can come in and turn off our auto levels, and I recommend doing this. Your audio is going to sound far better when you're on manual and you dial this in correctly. So we're going to select manual and then we're going to come to the record level. And as I talk, I can see that the uh, 
audio gain is turned way up. So we're, we're almost clipping out here. We have a new orange indicator, that's nice. But what we're gonna do is simply turn this down a little bit. Testing one, two, testing one, two. And what I'm looking for, it's okay to land in the yellow or the orange, but what we don't want is this red, that's bad. But I've turned it down a little bit, and there's also an audio noise reduction. It doesn't really work um, from what I've seen, so I just usually leave that turned off. But now when I see the levels, I can see that for the most part, we're in the orange or yellow, and that's what you want with video. Some of these other icons are very similar, but when we come down, our focusing modes are a little different. We'll talk about that in a second. We have direct access to whether we're using a wind filter or not. I'm gonna turn the wind filter off. We also have digital image stabilization. I recommend leaving this turned off. We have which video card we're recording to. Right now we're recording to one, We'd come in, we could set this up in different ways. And then we finally have our image resolution for video. We'll be talking about this in depth when we get into the deep menu. Suffice it to say, this is talking about resolution, the pixel dimensions, the frame rate, and the compression type. You'll also see that it tells us how much time we have left on that particular compression setting. If you got this camera, you're probably going to want to be shooting typically 4K 30 frames per second. We'll talk about the compression stuff. We can also shoot 4K 60, obviously requires more memory. But if I'm, if I'm doing 4K video, almost always 30 frames per second. What is this? Oh, this is light IPB. I prefer standard IPB. Go right there. Coming back out, if we were to continue to look or cycle through other kinds of video information, we get a video record button in the top right hand corner. We get some of these features are different because we're shooting in manual. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but for the most part, I just dial in my shutter speed and my aperture. We'll talk about video settings in depth a little bit later, but we also have this servo AF that will track focusing. Talk about that a little bit later too. We have the amount of time remaining, but pretty straightforward in regards to these symbols. If we were to push the info button again, we get the side columns, we get Q. The only things that have changed in here is we can select our card, we have our resolution, we have the audio recording level that we just went through already. We also have the headset monitor, so we can control the volume of our headset. This is digital image stabilization. For the most part, I do not use it. We have our white balance, picture styles, and subject to detect for video. So slightly different variations of these icons, and we'll be coming back to this a little bit later. So I'm gonna come back out to the stills mode. Here we go. Let's talk real quick about ISO. When you get your camera by default, your auto ISO should be turned on. And for this next lesson, I would prefer if you turn this to regular ISO because it's going to help you understand your exposure settings better. If you learn it, leave it turned on to auto ISO, the camera is going to be making adjustments to the ISO and it's going to be harder to see some of these changes. So what I want you to do is to tap your ISO and I want you to come over to example, maybe ISO 800. Well, it depends on how much light you have. Obviously, I'm trying to get a nice even exposure as I'm doing this. And you're gonna to wanna to have your camera in hand. It's going to depend on how much light you have in your room. But suffice it to say, we want to turn auto ISO off. So for this demonstration, what I'm gonna do, let me turn it down a little bit more. I'm gonna go AV mode. And you should do this. So I'm on aperture priority mode. Take a picture of something at a low ISO, in this case, ISO 400. When we zoom in at ISO 400 on the blinds, you can see that we get these nice clean edges. Lots of contrast, pretty sharp. But let's say we're shooting in a very low light situation and I needed to bump my ISO up way high. So we're just gonna turn it up as high as it'll go. The camera's gonna make some adjustments to the shutter speed. Uh, let's do this. It's saying it's a little bit too bright. Let's just adjust some of this. What's going on here? Oh, it's on lock. See, that happens. I bumped my lock switch. So I'm gonna take another picture with an ISO of 102,000, just to show you some of the differences between the two. 
And when I play it back and I zoom in on those same edges, what you'll notice is we get this salt and pepper. There's a lot of grain here. It's the same lighting situation I was just in. But because I'm using a faster shutter speed and a smaller aperture, I bumped my ISO up. And you can see there's a huge amount of difference between this and the one before it. So if we come back to this 400 and we zoom in, you can see that we get nice clean edges again. So this is the trade-off, is that as you increase your ISO, you can expect to see more noise. It's a grain. It is not pleasing to the eye. It is also going to be softer. There's not going to be as much sharpness. So this is something to keep in mind when you get into lower light situations and you start bumping up your ISO. There is this trade-off of, uh, you know, do you want to get the shot with some grain in it or do you want less grain? You may have to use a longer exposure. Just something to think about. Now that we have a general idea of what ISO does to us, we're gonna turn it back down in anywhere in the 400 to 800 for the next lesson. And what I'm about to teach you is probably the most important lesson on this video. We're gonna talk about exposure control, which is really brightness control. And then we're gonna talk about the focusing systems, probably the second most important lesson on this video. But exposure control is where most people struggle in the beginning. It's confusing. These are new terms that you don't know. So just hang in there and I will walk you through it. So let's talk about the mode dial real quick. It's on top of our camera here. And as we rotate it, you're gonna see these mode indicators changing. The dummy mode, which is really a green box mode, you'll notice that we lose so many of our settings and the camera is going to do most of the heavy lifting for us. In fact, there's very little we can change in here. It's basically turning your camera into a point and shoot almost like a cell phone camera. It's just gonna do everything for you. You did not spend this kind of money on a camera to shoot on the dummy mode. So if you are highly, highly confused about everything, I would recommend starting on the P mode. I don't even really like that. I kind of want my students shooting in aperture priority mode, but with P mode, at least you have more control over the dummy mode. In fact, I was just on a safari with a brand new photographer and he, he didn't I had an extra camera that I actually lent to him and he didn't know how to use it. And I said, look, just shoot on the P mode. I'm here if you have any questions. And he just shot on P mode for the whole trip, right? But if I am mentoring you, what I will tell you is to start off in aperture priority mode. There's really four modes that you should really be aware of. Manual, aperture priority, shutter priority, and the P mode. There's a hybrid mode called FV mode, we'll talk about that in a second. But for now, I want you to focus on aperture priority mode. Now, the reason why I like aperture priority mode is because it's very easy to understand. I think it is. Aperture priority means that we dial in the aperture in the camera. So if you remember, I was talking about primary selector, numero uno, it changes from the primary dial. One, our index finger on the primary dial. Watch what happens when I rotate this primary dial. You'll notice that the f-stop is changing. And again, the way f-stops work is that smaller numbers like f4 are wider openings. And much higher numbers result in smaller openings. So as I rotate the primary selector wheel in aperture priority, we are changing the primary setting, which is the aperture. So this is how we change the aperture. Now, something you should be wondering, you're saying, Michael, this doesn't make any sense. If you're changing the size of the opening of the lens, if you're making it larger and smaller, how come it's not changing the brightness of the image? It should, right? If, we, if we're going with a small opening, there's less light, it should become darker. So the secret of aperture priority is that the camera is making changes to the shutter speed. And we can prove it by tapping the shutter button and we can see our shutter speed. It's not highlighted in such a way that we can change, but as we change the aperture, now you can see the camera is changing the shutter speed simultaneously. This is the heart of the matter with aperture priority. We select the aperture and the camera selects the shutter speed. And because of this, we're getting a nice even exposure. If we have a very wide opening, 
the camera selects a faster shutter speed. If we have a very small opening like f22, now we're using a longer shutter speed. So this is a really important concept to understand is that the camera is helping us. It's allowing us to, to say, camera, do the shutter speed for me. Now there's actually a little bit more to this. And take your camera, open up the aperture as wide as it will go, the lowest F number. If you're in a dark room, this may not work very well, so you've got to have some light to work with. Tap the shutter button so you can see the shutter speed, and then you're going to take your hand and slowly move it in front of the lens. And as you block the light, what you'll notice is the shutter speed is changing. And so what's happening is the camera adjusts the shutter speed, not only based on the aperture, but also based on the amount of light entering the lens. That's what's happening. As we block the lens, it's trying to use a longer shutter speed to let more light in. One of the most common questions I get is, why is my shutter speed so slow in aperture priority mode? And, and the answer is, you're probably shooting in a low light situation. Go outside on a bright sunny day, and you'll notice that the shutter speed will get faster. When I shot weddings professionally, I would almost exclusively shoot on aperture priority mode during the event. And I'll give you an example. Let's say we're inside a church, it's kind of dark, and I'm shooting, and here comes the bride and the groom, they're walking down the aisle, so I gotta back up as I'm shooting, right? Now I'm in the lobby. It's a little bit brighter in the lobby. And you only get five or 10 seconds as they're walking through that lobby to get those shots. I don't wanna have to fumble with my shutter speed. So as I move into brighter conditions, the camera's using faster shutter speeds, and that works for me. And now we're outside, and now it's really sunny, really bright, and the camera's going to use even a faster shutter speed. And I don't have to worry about making those changes on the fly. So when time is short, I typically shoot on aperture priority. If I am in a studio and I have time, then I will shoot in manual. In manual, you dial in all the settings. I don't want to get off track right now. Sports shooting, almost always shoot aperture priority. Why? Because sometimes you get cloud cover and I'm shooting and I don't want to have to change my shutter speed as I'm shooting sports. I just let the camera deal with the shutter speed. Now, having said all this, there is a very important thing to remember is that if our shutter speed gets too long, it's going to be blurry. So there's some rules of thumb that I use. And I, when I'm shooting, I just sneak these little peaks over here toward my shutter speed. If I am hand-holding the camera and I am shooting portraits or landscapes, if I'm hand-holding, almost always want to be at least 1 60th of a second. If it gets longer than 1 60th of a second, we're going to run into some blurriness problems. The second rule of thumb is that if I am shooting sports, I typically like to see one five hundredth of a second. Now, it depends on the sport and the athlete and what they're doing and how fast they're moving. Some sports require one one thousandth, one two thousandth. You know, it just really depends. But minimum for shooting sports, I'm typically at one five hundredth of a second. So I'll sneak a peek as I'm shooting just to make sure that I'm at that one five hundredth. Those are the two barriers you should keep in mind. One sixth of a second for portraits and landscape. One five hundredth of a second for the beginning of slow moving sports. Now I want to take this a step further and teach you the skill of changing the brightness of your images in aperture priority mode. This is where the exposure compensation bar comes from. You'll notice here on the bottom, we have a negative three, negative two, negative one. It's like a diamond home plate, one, two, and three plus. So the short answer on this is to take a picture of something. I'm gonna change my cluster here, make it a little bit larger. See here as this go here. You can focus. So I'm going to take a picture. And let's say I'm reviewing this picture and I just decide, you know what? This is too dark. I want it to be brighter. This is how we do this. You can do it on the monitor by touching here. And we're just going to move this over to one. Come back out, take the picture, compare those two images. So here's the brighter one. And here's the more even one. That skill set alone, you're going to use it tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of times in your photography career, is just changing the brightness. Well, let's say this isn't enough. Let's say we want to make it even brighter. I can come back in, go to two, 
take a picture. So in those three pictures, you can see there's a difference in brightness. Well, let's say after this picture, I want it darker. We would just go in the opposite direction. Let's go to negative one. Negative is darker, negative one. So you can see that as we play back, we are controlling the brightness of the image by changing the exposure compensation. We can make it even darker. Here it is at negative two. So that is the short answer of how we change the brightness of the image. If we're in aperture priority mode, we are going to change the exposure compensation. Now, you'll notice that I'm changing this in a different way. And if we tap the shutter button to wake up the camera, we can rotate the rear control well. This is something that I do when I'm looking through the viewfinder. I'll just come in and do this instead of tapping the monitor and, and then scrolling to the left or right. So there's two different ways you can change that. Again, using this or tap the shutter button first, you get the orange indicator, and then we can go up or down. Now I'm going to give you an explanation on the longer side of this because I want you to understand what these numbers mean. What this plus one, plus two, and plus, what do those actually mean? Those refer to stops of light. You're gonna hear that term a lot in your photography career. What is a stop of light? The short answer on this, it is twice as much or half as much of light as another setting. So if I go from zero to one, I am adding twice the amount of light as I did before. If I'm going to negative one from zero, now I'm using half as much light. And that's what stops mean. It's double or half the amount of light depending on the previous setting. So I can prove this to you, and this is actually really amazing. It's like, I get excited about this. Is if you touch a shutter button, we can see that the shutter speed recommended here is 1 640th. I'm gonna actually adjust this just a little bit. So we can see that the shutter speed at the setting is 1 500th of a second. Watch what happens when I come up to plus one. Now we're at 1 250th of a second. So if you remember fractions from school, 1 500th, plus one five hundredth is two five hundredths. And if we were to simplify two five hundredths, well now we have one two hundred and fiftieth. And that's how we can mathematically prove that we have twice the amount of light based on a longer shutter speed. We've doubled the duration of time that light is hitting the sensor. So let me ask you this. What if we go to plus two? What do you think it would be? Now, if you said one 125th of a second, you're absolutely right. There it is. Why? Because one 250th plus one 250th is two 250ths. If we simplify that, that's one 125th of a second. And if you guess on plus three, if you said one 60th, you are also absolutely correct. So you can see that this is how exposure compensation works. Is that if we're shooting and all our images are a little dark, we can come in and bump it up, maybe a third of a stop. Every tick mark is one third. Every number is a whole stop. So when I was shooting weddings, I would almost always be shooting at about here or about here. And that gives the camera instructions to change the brightness by adding a little bit longer of a shutter speed. That's what it means. Now at one 500th of a second, what do you think would happen if we went to negative one? A shutter speed that is half as long. It's twice as fast. Some of these terms are kind of confusing. But a shutter speed that is one half of one five hundredth, that's right, it's one one thousandth of a second. It's faster shutter speed. What if we went to negative two? That's right, one two thousandth of a second. And as you could probably guess, if we went to negative three, we're at now one four thousandth of a second. So we're using a faster and faster shutter speed to let in less and less light. I know I've thrown a lot at you in this short lesson on exposure. If you study this and you make it a priority, you are going to be in fantastic shape to starting your photography career because you will use these skill sets for the rest of your life.
aperture priority. We dial in the aperture. The camera decides the shutter speed. We can control the brightness by using exposure compensation. And this is achieved by telling the camera to cheat the exposure in one direction or another by changing the shutter speed. We also have a couple barriers, 1 60th of a second for portraits, for shooting handheld, or 1 500th of a second if we're shooting sports. Pretty good summary of what's going on with aperture priority mode. Now what I wanna do is flip this over to TV mode. TV mode stands for time value. In our primary selector, numero uno, as we rotate it, you will notice it no longer changes the aperture, it changes the shutter speed. So this is why I call it the primary selector. The primary selector changes the primary setting of the mode that we're shooting in. In this case, it's time value. So as we rotate this, we're changing the time or the shutter speed of the camera. And if we tap the shutter button, we can see that the camera is changing the aperture to compensate for this. So we can see this as we change from longer shutter speeds to faster shutter speeds. Something else I wanna point out, let's use a longer shutter speed here. Again, if we take our hand and cover the lens, the camera is going to try to let in more light or less light with the aperture. So I have a little question for you. I want you to think about it. Let's say you want to shoot sports on shutter priority mode. A lot of people do this. It's just easier for them to, re to remember, I'm gonna dial in my shutter speed and let the camera deal with the aperture, right? Michael said we should be shooting at 1 500th of a second to start. So we come in, oh, it's getting, something's happening here. It's getting darker. Okay, one five hundredth of a second. Wow, that's really dark. You know, if we shoot sports, we're not gonna be able to see these pictures. And then when you tap the shutter button, the aperture starts flashing. Aperture flashing like that means the camera is not happy. And what it's telling us is that it has reached the maximum limit of the opening of the lens and looking at the exposure, this is gonna be dark. So what would you do in this situation? How would you resolve this? You have to shoot at 1 500th of a second. The lens is open as wide as it will go and the camera is not happy. Think about it for just a minute. If you said bump up your ISO, you're absolutely right. We can come in here and bump it up to maybe 3200. Tap the shutter button, the flashing has stopped. This is going to happen to you a lot. And you will also do this with aperture priority mode is that if you get into a situation, you're hand holding, shutter speed's getting very, very long. Well, yeah, now we need to bump up the ISO to compensate for the loss of light. Now it's not pure light, this is a boost, it's like a cheat. So we always wanna kinda leave it as low as we can, but yeah, in some cases you're gonna have to do this. Bump your ISO up to allow the camera to get the shot. Modern cameras are actually really good you can shoot at 3200, 6400 sometimes and see very little grain. It's when you get into the extreme ISOs that it becomes a problem. Exposure compensation works similarly, but the adjustments happen with the aperture. So if I wanted to make it brighter, here we go, you can see it just got a little bit brighter. If I wanted to make it darker, it's changing the aperture to make the image brighter or darker. That's how you do it in AV mode or TV mode. Real quick, I wanted to talk about the program mode. Program mode is a little wonky, simply because it doesn't look like we can change our settings we can, but the way it works is it really gives us combinations where the camera's throwing out different combinations between shutter speeds and apertures, also depending on the light. So in this, if we don't have this highlighted, you know, rotating these dials isn't gonna do anything. We tap the shutter button, we get our primary selector is changing our shutter speed. So as we change our shutter speed, the camera's making adjustments to the aperture, and that's how we can manage them in a way. We just look at them and we're looking for the right combination that we want. Maybe you want to shoot at f4, you would rotate it until you got f4, and you're looking at that. It's kind of, it's sort of like taking the training wheels off a little bit, but there's still a lot of help. We can change the brightness by exposure compensation. And the thing about this is you'll see changes to both the shutter speed and the aperture as we change the brightness. Same basic principle though, you can bump it up or bump it down. Program mode is great if you want the camera to help you a lot. And there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. And as a further point of clarification, your final image only cares about the shutter speed, aperture, the ISO. 
the camera doesn't care how you got there, whether it's manual mode, aperture priority mode, or program mode, those settings are the same in all those, all those modes in the same lighting situation. There are very high-end professional wedding photographers I know of who shoot in program mode. So don't let that stop you. The main thing is, is you're competent with the modes. I personally use aperture priority mode and manual mode almost all the time. If I am shooting an event that requires that I have a flash on, I will shoot in the P mode because that is the handheld flash mode for Canon. It's a lot to go into, I know. So let's talk real quick about manual mode. Manual mode is different than the other modes because we dial in the shutter speed, primary selector. We can dial in the aperture. You can see the full orange dot. That's this control. And the camera obeys. We just dial it in. I use manual mode when I have time. Like in a, if I'm in a studio setting with flash or if I'm not rushed, I'm almost always shooting in manual mode. We can also adjust, obviously, our ISO. We dial in all three settings and the camera obeys us, basically. Something that's interesting you'll notice is the exposure compensation bar. I can't select it now. And in this mode, it is no longer an exposure compensation bar. This is an exposure meter. It's just simply telling us how bright or how dark the image is. If I cover this, it's saying, hey, it's really dark. You know, and if I let in more light, saying, hey, it's pretty, pretty bright. So this is a light meter at this point. We don't change exposure compensation in manual mode. There is an exception that I'm about to point out. So we also have this feature where we can come into our ISO and we can put the camera back into auto ISO. There is a time and place for this, and the best example I can think of is MMA fighting. If you're in an MMA arena that's very dark and it has lights coming on and flashing and going, it's a nightmare of a situation to deal with getting those settings right. In that situation, I would come in, I would designate one five hundredth of a second for my shutter speed, I would open my aperture as wide as it could go, and then I would leave the ISO on auto. And the reason why you want to do that is because when you have rapid changing lighting conditions, in this case, especially for a sport, the camera would make the adjustments to the ISO. So if you're about to shoot and it's kind of darker and you take the shot and here come all the lights, the camera can make the adjustment to the ISO. And there's a lot of people who love to shoot indoor sports this way, especially when you get rapidly changing lighting conditions or concerts or things of that nature where you don't have control and things are changing a lot. That's the time to shoot in auto ISO. So there is another mode on the R6 Mark II that I want to talk about real quick, and that is the FV mode, the flexible value. And this is very cool. There are people who absolutely love this mode. What the FV mode allows you to do is you can see each of our three settings have auto. We can come in and control our time value. Let's say we, let's say we decide we want to control the time value only, right? What we do is we come in, we lock it, and the camera will now make adjustments to the aperture or the ISO. You know, we can also change our exposure compensation this way. When we tap the shutter button, it commits to those settings and it remembers them briefly. And then as the shoot goes back on, it would jump back out to auto again. So here. So it's committing to those settings. As long as you see a line underneath those settings, what that means is, is that camera will jump back to auto. So let's say we want regular ISO control. We just dial it in and that line disappears, which means we have a flexible value where the camera is now going to only adjust the aperture. There's some people that love it. I don't recommend my students do this because I want them to learn aperture priority mode first because they're going to get a lot of mileage out of that. So I know it's a lot of information. We've gone over the mode dial. We've talked about each of the four major modes, my recommendations of when you should use them, the different shutter speeds, how to make images brighter or darker. I know it's a lot of information, but if you can just learn that one lesson, you are going to be in fantastic shape. There are a couple more things you'll notice about the mode dial. Let's talk about them real quick. B stands for the bulb mode. This is really better used with the remote shutter. The idea of the bulb mode is that we can have very long exposures by pushing and holding the shutter button down. 
And you can see we get this timer in the bottom right hand corner. And then when we release it, the exposure ends. This is better for certain kinds of astrophotography, very long exposures. It's pure white because it's overexposed, but that's the bulb mode. You control how long the, ex the exposure is by pushing and holding down the shutter. Next on the top, we have three different modes. There's a C1, C2, and C3. Those deal with the custom modes. And the way this works is you would set your camera up to shoot a certain way. Let's say you were shooting portraits and you wanted to shoot wide open and you would come in and dial in everything that you wanted from your white balance to your picture styles, your focusing modes, all of that. And once this is set up the way you like it, you would come into your yellow tab, page six, custom shooting mode, register settings at C1, we're gonna hit okay. And what that will do is that when we rotate to that C1, all of those settings are remembered. You can see it even indicates that we saved it as aperture priority mode. This is very handy if you do different genres of shooting. If you're a sports photographer and you also do a lot of portrait photographer, you may want to have it preset up so you don't have to set your camera up each time you go to those different kinds of shoots or underwater photography. It just really depends on your doing. Those are the custom modes. Once we get past C3, we come into the filter modes. Most of these, I consider them to be gimmicky, but there's a couple cool, cool ones in here you should know about. So we can come in and we can choose the filter effect, whether it's grainy black and white, soft focus, there's a fisheye effect. If we were to select this, you can see it's bending the shape of my blinds. There's a water painting effect, toy camera effect, miniature effect, HDR. These are semi-useful, the HDR ones. They're kind of fun to play with. And you know, if you're in a, in a jam and you need some HDR, this is where you'd come in and set them. But for the most part, I never use these. Then we come into the scene modes. The scene modes are really designed in such a way that you would come in and select what you're doing. So if you're shooting portraits, you would select this. If you're shooting group photos, you do that. Landscapes, we have a panoramic shot, sports shooting, kids shooting, panning with vehicles macro photography, food photography, we have a night portrait, we have a handheld night scene mode, HDR backlight control, and silent shutter. Silent shutter would, would come in handy. But the idea on this is that the camera allows you to choose the setting and the subject that you're shooting, and it takes care of everything else. You're going to lose a lot of control and not really understand what the camera's doing if you just select these things and you shoot this way. Some people do this. Panoramic mode is definitely useful when you need it. I stay away from these and I have my students stay away from them because you can accomplish everything you need to if you know the camera settings themselves and how to apply them. This is, is kind of like a shortcut if you don't want to figure those things out. And when you come into them, what you'll notice is you don't have the control. So for shooting portrait, where did all the camera settings go? You can't change anything right? Where's the exposure compensation? Where's our white balance? How do we change these settings? If we come in and hit Q, you're going to notice that most of those settings are missing. So we lose a lot of control when we shoot in these scene modes, which is why I do not recommend them. So on your mode dial, this last one, it's like an A with a film strip. This is a hybrid dummy mode, which means it's going to allow you to shoot stills and videos in such a way that you can shoot hybrid. You don't have to you know, press this button over here. It just tries to make it a little bit more simple. Again, I never use it because if I'm shooting video, I'm in the video mode and I want full control. So that is an overview of our mode dial. For the next lesson, I'm gonna be in aperture priority and we're gonna start talking about the focusing modes. The easiest way for me to break this down is to say it in the how, the when, and the where. How, when, and where. If you think of focusing in those three terms, this is going to be easy. The first part of this is how does the camera focus? There's actually a number of different ways we can do it. Again, we talked about using a halfway shutter button depression where we push just into that spongy resistance. The camera starts focusing and we, it's indicated with this green box and a beep. We can also push the AF on button, also achieving focus lock. And we can also try to focus. It's having a hard time focusing here, but we can also touch on the monitor. 
So those are three different ways in terms of the how. Halfway shutter button depression, AF on, touch on the monitor. Now let's talk about the when the camera is focusing. How, when, and where, right? So the when is how often the camera is engaging the focusing systems. And this deals with what is called the focusing modes. Right now, we can access our camera's focusing modes by pressing the Q button and coming here to the second box right here. There's one shot, AI focus, and AI servo. One shot means that the camera is going to achieve focusing lock one time. And then if we push and hold the shutter button halfway down, the focus will not change. In fact, if we get a focusing lock and we rotate the camera, so if I focus here, and I move the camera, the focus will not change. This is great for subject matter that is still and cooperating. And so people will say, why would you want to change the position of your camera? Well, you might have a person sitting in the middle of your screen, you get a focusing lock, and we can recompose it to make it more aesthetically pleasing. We have the person over here, like if you're short on time, you get a focus lock, boom. And then when you're ready to take the picture, push it down all the way. So when we're talking about one shot, it means that the camera will focus one time. I'll do it with the back button. Here's the focus lock, and I can move the camera, push the shutter button down all the way to take the picture. That's the heart of the matter with one shot. You get one focusing lock. Now if I come in and I go to servo, it's different. When I engage focusing, you'll notice that it's not a green box, it's a blue box now. In servo mode is different in that it focuses over and over and over again as long as we are engaging the focusing systems. This is great for sports and fast moving subjects where their position is changing. Maybe we're dealing with children who are small running around. We want to shoot them on servo mode because as long as we're engaging that, the camera will update their focusing systems. It'll continue to focus on it over and over and over again. You'll notice we don't get a beep, no green box. That's the key indicator of the differences, still subject matter versus moving subject matter. Now, I also wanna make a point about this. There's a hybrid mode in here called AI focus. AI focus is the camera's attempt to blend the two together. We have one shot in servo. There was a time, you know, I, I would try to shoot this way when I was dealing with a, a dancing bride. She's moving and now she stopped or she's moving again, now she stopped. Now the problem with this is, is that we're turning this over to the camera. We're telling the camera, camera, I want you to decide whether we're dealing with a still or a moving subject. And sometimes the camera can get confused and you'll miss. For that reason, I rarely use AI focus. If I'm dealing with any subject matter that might be moving, I'm on servo. Servos can still work fine, you know, if the subject's still, it's, it's fine, but this way the, the camera is not making the decision, it's not hesitating, and it just seems more consistent when you specifically choose between the two of those. So that is the when the camera is focusing. We talked about the how, we've talked about the when, now let's talk about the where. The where deals with the camera's focusing clusters. The clusters can be accessed by pushing this corner button right here. We can also access them by coming up to the top right here. You will see them on the bottom of your screen. The way this works is these are different sizes. If we were to go through them real quick, we have spot AF, which is a very small square. It's teeny tiny. It's great for shooting birds that have landed in shrubbery where you need a precise focus, for example. Then we have a slightly, it's gonna let me do this. Then we have a slightly larger square, one point autofocus. Then we have an expanded area autofocus. We have these four boxes around it. And then we have expanded AF area around. All that we're doing is we're selecting a larger area to choose from. We also have these customizable flexible zone AF, one, two, and three. Why do I say customizable? If we hit this rate feature, which is also this button up here, and we rotate either of our selectors, we can change the size and shape of those focusing clusters. For example, if you're shooting birds in flight, and they're mostly in the center of the frame here, 
we're telling the camera to only look in this area. See, the camera's starting to look there. I have my tracking on. I'm going to turn that off in a second. Very useful if you need to designate specific areas for birds in flight. Let's try that again. You want to go like that. Pretty amazing. And then at the very end, whole area AF is overlooked. This is going to look at the entire frame and it's going to look for an area of contrast. So it likes this left side of the blinds. Very good for shooting birds in flight when you're shooting into a bright sky and there's not a lot of foliage behind them. Definitely something that you should use and be aware of. Also good for eye detection if you're dealing with a single subject. So this is the where. These are our cameras focusing clusters. We can also designate the exact location by using the joystick, moving it around. We can touch on the screen to tell the camera, hey, look in this one spot. So that is the where, which deals with the camera's focusing clusters. Super useful. Now, having said all that, there are a number of other secondary focusing features that you should be aware of. For example, when we press the focusing clusters, you can see we got this info on, info off. So now when it says on, this is a tracking feature. You can see that the box will start to grow and it will start to move around. Let me put a focusing square up there to demonstrate this a little bit better. I've put a focusing square up there and keep in mind that our tracking is turned to on. I'm in servo. I'm gonna hit the AF on button. It's going to engage it. And you can see that as I'm moving, the focusing square is more or less staying locked on it. So when you're dealing with subject matter on clean backgrounds that's moving, this might be the way to go. Single bird in flight on a bright background sky, you can see that it's moving. So what happens when we turn this to off? Well, now when we get the focusing lock, you can see that the square doesn't stay locked on it. It's just going to focus where we have the square positioned. And that's the difference between tracking and non-tracking. So let me come in here and turn it back to on. And then we're going to come in and we are going to turn to one shot. So one shot doesn't work with tracking. You can see that even though I have tracking on, nothing's happening. It only works with servo or if we're getting AI focus and it's able to track a moving subject. Suffice it to say, the tracking does not work with one shot. So we're going to turn this back to servo. Let's talk a little bit about face and eye detection. This is going to be size dependent in your viewfinder. So if you're trying to shoot somebody who's very far away or they're very small, it's usually pretty small, but if they're far away enough, it's not gonna work. I'm gonna zoom in and cl close to show you. Just had somebody email me this morning asking me how to be more specific about where face detection works. So in the beginning, be aware that your face detection is in this menu setting, subject to detect. Typically it's on auto. And if we have a large or the whole area AF, you can see that it automatically jumps on to the eye. So even as I move to the left and right, we get sort of like this tracking where the camera is keeping track over which eye. So when you're using the whole area AF and you have eye detection turned on, the camera is previewing subject matter with an eye to detect. If I push AF on, I'm in the servo mode. You can see that it has this automatic tracking. It's engaging. What do these arrows mean? These arrows are allowing to designate which eye we're focusing on. Eye detection is an absolute game changer for portrait photographers if you've never used one, before, you know, a camera that has this feature. When we were shooting DSLRs, we would have to put the focusing square on their eye and then we'd recompose and it was a nightmare. But now what we're seeing is that we're getting almost edge to edge, see how it jumped to the face detection, but we're almost getting edge to edge detection for eye detection. Now this is going to get a little bit more complicated as you have more and more people in your shot and you want to be specific about who you're focusing on. There's a different way that I recommend doing this is that instead of going with a whole area, is that you would come into a flexible zone. I hit the rate button. I can control the size of my zone, right? Hit okay. And now I can be very specific about 
who I'm focusing on is still jumping on me because there's only one face, but there, if there was a second face here, I could tell the camera to focus on this person's eye, right? So that's a very important thing to know is that we have the ability to get very specific about face or eye detection depending on the cluster we're using. Smaller cluster, right? So as I put that cluster over my eye, my model's eye here, it's more focusing on that. It, it still recognizes face detection. We can, I wonder how I wonder how specific it would be. Yeah. Now there is a better way to set this up because when you turn eye detection on globally, the camera may you know look into some bushes and shrubbery and say, hey, there's a pattern of a face in here. So what I typically do is I customize the star button to be eye detection. The way we do that is we push, we're gonna come into, let me come out here. We're gonna go into our Q menu, hit this, customize buttons. I'm gonna come down, this guy, the flash exposure lock, and I'm going to come over until I see a autofocus. There it is, there. So what this allows me to do is to activate eye detection by pushing the star button. So we, and then we'll, what we'll do is we'll come in and we'll turn off this. So now we have dual back button focusing where the AF on is engaging normal focusing. So there's no eye detection. It has tracking, but if I wanted to go into eye detection, now I push the star button and jumps right into it. This is how I typically recommend setting it up because now you have a portrait focusing and you have a regular focusing. Very, very powerful. Another customization that I really, really like that I've made videos about is if you remember that depth of field preview button that we have in front of the camera. I come in here. I really like to set that up to be my focus cluster selector that I can cycle through different clusters. Let's see if we can find that thing. There it is. Step the field preview. I'm going to come in here and now I'm going to go to cluster cycling. Come back out, hit my info button. Now what I can do is I can push that depth of field preview and I can cycle through my clusters directly and very quickly. So here I have my regular focusing. Now I can go to a bigger square. Now I can go to eye detection. And go to regular focus. This is what you're going to want to do, especially as a wildlife or a bird photographer, to be able to cycle and jump through your focusing modes, your focusing types very, very quickly. Now, because I have focusing clusters with my depth of field preview, I don't really need this guy. So what I typically do for this customization, and you don't have to do this, these are just recommendations, come into my buttons, and I'm going to change the cluster button to my focusing mode button. This one here, why? Because now when I'm shooting, I can designate between one shot or servo very quickly. Here's my one shot, now I'm in servo, right? Gives tremendous speed and flexibility in changing your focusing squares. Having said all this, there's even more focusing techniques that I wanna demonstrate because I want you to know as many of these as you can. And on the crash course, I will demonstrate how I use these different techniques in different shooting situations. This next one deals with manual focusing. Now we can try to focus manually. You'll see as I, as I rotate the manual focusing wheel, nothing's happening. So if I flip it over to manual focus, we can change our focus directly here. But what I like to do is a technique called manual zoom focusing where I push the magnifying glass, I can zoom in. And we do this by putting the square over where we want. You only see the square in autofocus, flip it over to manual. Now I hit the zoom button and I'm punching in on the eye of our model. I shoot manual focus a lot for video, but now that we're punched in, I can rotate the focusing wheel on the lens and I can get attack sharp focus. I guess that picture is a little blurry, but it's something like that. So that is the manual 
zoom focus technique. But there is yet another one. If we come into the menu and we come up to the purple tab, which deals with our focusing systems, a lot of this is stuff that we've seen already, tracking and whatnot. Keep coming over to this feature here. So this is manual focus peaking settings. And if I come in here and turn this to on, and I have a red color, when I come out, you can now see there's a little red highlight wherever the camera is focusing. And this deals with looking at contrast. So if I were to focus out, you can see that the peaking disappears. As I get sharper and sharper focus, we get a clearer and clearer red outline. We can change the colors of our focus peaking. Let's do yellow. Now we have a yellow outline. Let's see, kind of lose some of it as we focus out. Should be there. Look at the eyes. There it is. Now, if I if I punch in and I zoom in and try to use peaking, you don't see it. So just be aware of that. But that is peaking focus. Again, very super powerful stuff. And we also have some other tools in here. One's called the focusing guide. We'll turn that on so I can demonstrate it. I used this on a video shoot way back when. I don't use it anymore. But when you rotate your manual focus ring, you're telling the camera to look in this square. And when those arrows are all pointing at each other and it turns green, that's another way that you know you're in focus. So there's so many different ways to focus the camera. There's autofocus, there's servo, there's one shot, there's tracking, there's different squares but I've tried to break this down into the easiest in terms of the how, the when, the where, and then we talked about some of the manual focusing techniques. This is all for stills and video. We're gonna talk about the video stuff in just a second because there's, there's slightly different things in the video mode. One last thing I wanna point out, and this is a question I get a lot, go back into regular focus, turn this guy off, turn this one to off, is that many sports shooters will ask me, how do you use dedicated back button focus? This guy for sports shooting. The way you do it is you remove auto focus from the shutter button. I do not recommend that if you're a pure beginner, but I'm gonna show you how to do it because at some point you may want to, if you get into heavy sports shooting. Customize button. Here it is right here, the shutter button. Any button that you're looking to customize, it'll be highlighted in white. So as I rotate through this, you can see the different buttons available for customization. Too bad we can't do the rate button because I would customize that a little differently. But to get dedicated back button focus, we remove autofocus from the halfway shutter button depression by just choosing the metering icon. What this does is it tells the camera to not engage focus when we push a shutter button halfway down. I'm pushing it halfway down and nothing's happening. We push the AF on button, now we get focus. Sports shooters do this for a particular reason to make sure that they are in control of when the camera is focusing versus it's not. So it's focusing, 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 lift the thumb up, it's no longer focusing. And if they shoot by recomposing, the focal plane should be in the same ballpark area. It's just a, a faster way to manipulate focus versus manual focus. If you set that up, and you forget about it, you're gonna think your camera's broken. So you're gonna be like, why isn't my camera focusing? What's going on? Well, it's because you, you took off the focusing from the shutter button when you, you know when you go back to shoot portraits or whatever. So if that happens, check your lens switch, make sure you did not customize that. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the how, the when, and the where of general focusing for stills. We talked about how you do it, the focusing modes, and the focusing clusters. Now, because we're on the subject matter of focusing, I wanna talk about focusing specifically in video mode. So you'll notice that we get eye detection, and this is really great, especially if you're a talking head kind of content creator. You know, I do that a lot. So when, when I'm shooting myself, I want that eye detection turned on with my servo AF on. And what this will do is it will track your face as you move to and from side to side of the viewfinder, which means the camera should always be in focus. A lot of times we have to shoot in manual, which means the focus will not change. Like if you have multiple people in the frame, probably better to do on manual because you don't want the camera jumping around from person to person. But for a single person, we have servo AF. 
Something to keep in mind, I'll be giving many demonstrations on the crash course about how to focus with video. Something else we can do is we can do our manual focusing. We flip it over, we can do the punch in. Again, all of these techniques are pretty much more or less the same. We can do peaking focus that we talked about. Come back out. But there is another technique I want to demonstrate using Servo AF called the rack zoom focus technique, and I need to set it up real quick. So in this example, I have set it up to have this focusing target here in my face over here. I have face detection on. Obviously, maybe I don't want to have face detection on, so I would come into my Q menu, turn that off, and then I would choose a single focusing square. This is typically how I would do a rack zoom. You see it in Hollywood all the time where they're jumping focus from one subject matter to another. Remember, this is a touchscreen monitor. So in 2014, when the Canon 70D first came out, I still remember how shocked I was because it did it so well and it's only gotten better that we can touch on the screen and the camera will jump focus. In Hollywood, typically the person that does this is called the first AC, first assistant camera operator. And they usually use sophisticated gears and pins to manipulate the focus. But now, because we have these touch monitor screens and very quiet focusing motors, we can shift the focus simply by going servo AF and touching on the monitor. And I'll give some more demonstrations about this on the crash course, very powerful technique. Now, because we're here and we're going to talk about video a little bit, I'm gonna flip this over to the manual mode and give you the setup for video shooting. So there's something very important about your shutter speed when you are shooting video. So I'm shooting at 30 frames per second. In this case, I can hit my Q button. I can come into my, my setup of my resolution. I'm shooting 4K, 29.97 frames per second. And I'm shooting with a compression of IPB, which is an inter-frame compression, which means the camera is looking at the previous and the next frames to try to figure out what's changed and it's compressing accordingly. It's a lot to go into. I talk more about it on the crash course, but suffice it to say 4K 30 frames per second. Now, because I'm shooting at 30 frames per second, I want my shutter speed to be double the inverse. 30 frames per second times two is 60. Put that under an inverse, it's 1 60th. So if you change your frame rate, for example, let's say I shoot at 120 frames per second, then I would shoot at about 1 250th of a second to maintain that rule. It's called the 180 degree shutter rule. You multiply your frames per second and you invert it. So if, if I'm shooting at 120, it'd be 240 or 250, 1 250th. In this case, I'm shooting at 30 frames per second, so I'm at 1 60th. Then I dial in my aperture on here. Let's shoot with a wide aperture. Once I have my aperture, then I do my final tweaking with my ISO. And that's how I set up the camera. Follow the 180 degree shutter rule, aperture, ISO, and obviously I'd be using lighting as well. I'm going to jump back over to stills mode. And I want to talk real quick about white balance. Our eyes are very amazing at adjusting to different light sources. Camera sensors, not so much, which means that when we use different light sources with cameras, the cameras have a harder time adjusting. The short answer is if you're a pure beginner or relatively new, you're going to shoot on auto white balance most of the time. AWB is auto white balance. And if we come into the black screen, it might be a little bit less confusing. It's right there. So auto white balance gives the camera permission to adjust what it thinks it's shooting in. Over some time, what will happen is you will be shooting in lighting conditions and your images, will, the color will start to look off. It might be a little blue or a little yellow and you won't be happy with it. So the intermediate answer is you want to adjust your white balance. So here it is, auto white balance, according to the type of light you're shooting in. So if I'm shooting in daylight, I would choose the sun icon. If I was shooting in shade, I would choose the shade icon. In cloud cover, we have incandescent light or tungsten light, so light bulbs. We have fluorescent lights. We have flash or strobes. And then we have custom or Kelvin. 
So the intermediate answer is that if you're shooting and you notice something's weird in your images, you go, you're going to want to pick the icon of the environment you're shooting in. So as a side note, these white balance settings are more important when we are shooting JPEG. Video is a form of JPEG. When we're shooting raw, it's a lot easier to go in and correct the color if it's off. Now the images that we see on our back monitor these are little JPEG thumbnails. So even if you're shooting raw, you're gonna be looking at a little JPEG thumbnail, and that little JPEG thumbnail is gonna be different than your raw image. But raw files capture all of the color data, and you can go in and manipulate them much e easier, at least the lossless raw files. We will talk about the different kinds of raw files in part two of this video when we go into the deep menu section. Now there is an even deeper part of white balance in that we have other controls the first of which I'm going to talk about is the custom white balance. The custom white balance allows us to shoot. So we're going to take a picture and we're going to tell the camera this is white. And hit set. And th this will automatically update the color temperature of what we're shooting in. Now, this custom white balance is ideal when we are shooting in mixed lighting conditions. Maybe we're shooting in fluorescent with tungsten light. Maybe we have a little bit of sunlight coming in and we have some light lamps. When I shot weddings, I would do this all the time with uh, you know, the bride's dress sometimes, maybe a wall, maybe a ceiling. What you're going to look for is something white in the environment you're shooting in. You are going to take a picture. Here it is. Again, it says garbage can icon, shoot to set white balance. And then the camera knows that this is supposed to be white in that setting. So that's an intermediate answer. Now the long answer to this is very complex. We're gonna to go to the Kelvin setting. We're gonna hit set to, to change the color temperature. I am shooting with daylight balanced light bulbs. And so I know that that temperature is between 5100 and 5200. So what is Kelvin? Kelvin is a way to measure the temperature of light that we are shooting in. If you take a look at candlelight, for example, that's, that's a very yellow light. It's also a very low Kelvin light. So as I turn this down to match what candlelight is, it's around 2600, you'll notice that the screen gets really, really blue. And what's happening here is the camera is adding blue to counteract the yellow light created by candlelight. So lower Kelvin temperature lights tend to be more yellow. But to add to the confusion to this, when we look at the appearance of the image, we would say this is a cool looking image, right? Or if it was yellow, we would say this is a hot looking image. That has nothing to do with Kelvin temperature. Kelvin temperature is the actual temperature of the light source. And when we use the Kelvin temperature of our camera, we are adding yellow or blue to counteract the color effect of that light. So candlelight, very yellow, low Kelvin temperature, we're adding blue back in. If we were to go to a much higher Kelvin temperature, say 9,000, you can see that it's getting very, very orange. Why? Because high Kelvin temperature lights are very blue and the orange is there to counteract it. So this is what's happening. And I know that's kind of, I, a lot of people are, you know, they get confused by this. Suffice it to say, every color temperature has a specific Kelvin. And probably the most important one you wanna know is daylight, because daylight, the sun, daylight balanced bulbs run around 51 to 5200. If you're dealing with light bulbs, then light bulbs, tungsten lights, those are a little bit more yellow. Those can be in the 3200 range. You can see it's turning a little bit blue. That is the long answer. So it's there for you if you want to revisit this a couple times, but Kelvin temperature deals with the actual temperature of the light source. And when we use that feature, we can add in different amounts of yellow or blue. But in the short run, as a beginning photographer, I want you to, to stick with your auto white balance because it's just going to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Now, having said all this, there is something else I forgot to point out that I'm going to talk about right now. The light bulbs that I'm shooting in are LED. 
If you're using an electronic shutter, let's visit this real quick. So let's go with a pure electronic shutter at 1 500th of a second. Watch what happens. This is the banding problem that you are going to see if you shoot electronic shutter in flickering lights. The way to fix this is to come in and go with a mechanical shutter. Watch what happens. The banding is fixed. So if you see something like this, you are using a shutter speed that is too fast for LED lights. So we're at 1 125th of a second, we're on mechanical, I'm gonna come into electronic, take the picture again. You can see that the, the longer shutter speed corrected it. It's when we get into these faster shutter speeds, oh, not that much, that we get the banding. There it is again. So either you're gonna use a slower shutter speed or we can come in and go with mechanical shutter. That will also correct it. So something to keep in mind. And that is a quick overview on how to deal with banding if you see it shooting with electronic shutter. Let's talk about our camera's drive modes. Just real quick, we talked about it briefly, but here are the drive modes right here. And this is what the camera does after we push the shutter button down all the way, whether it's a single burst, a multiple burst, or a timer. So we have our drive mode selected. The first one is single shooting, pretty straightforward. You push the shutter button down, it's gonna take one image. High speed continuous burst in mechanical and electronic first is 12 frames per second. It's 40 frames per second in electronic shutter. This next one is 5.5 mechanical. I think it's seven if we're talking about first shutter curtain electronic in 20 in electronic, if I'm not mistaken. You'll notice that we get a slightly different look of it where it turns green out here. And then we have our low speed continuous burst. It's a slightly different icon. That's going to be about three frames per second if we're using mechanical or electronic first shutter curtain, five frames per second on electronic shutter. Then we have our 10 second timer, our two second timer, we also have the number of shots with the timer. We can come in and adjust this up or down. 10 second timer with up to nine shots. And this, ladies and gentlemen, are our drive modes. Let's talk about the camera's metering modes. If you remember when we were talking about aperture priority, the camera changes its camera settings based on how much light is coming in. This is how this feature functions. So if I press the Q button down here, in the bottom left-hand corner, I'm going to change that. We get our metering modes here on the bottom. The easiest way for me to explain the metering modes is in something called the spot metering mode. And you, you can see that I've set up a light a headlamp here. I'm going to turn this to the side. So you can see this little circle in the middle of the screen. If you see this little circle in the middle of the screen, you are in the spot metering mode. Suffice it to say, metering modes tell the camera to measure light from specific shapes of the viewfinder. In this case, a tight, small circle. So what's happening is the camera is measuring light in the blinds right here, right? So watch what happens when we go over to the bright light. So we get that circle over the very, very bright light and the camera is only measuring light here. And it's saying, we need a very fast shutter speed if you want to expose this light correctly. And if we continue to move the camera and it's sampling light in another part, it ignores the highlight. Let's get this guy over here. It's struggling a little bit with backlight. In fact, let's just go to here. So in this case, it ignores the light. So the short answer is if you are just getting started, on metering mode, I want you to go with the evaluative metering mode because it measures the entire scene and it does it with different percentages based on the center or the corners. The evaluative mode is sort of like the bread and butter of metering modes. And then if you need to shoot with the spot metering mode, this is really good when you're shooting into very heavy backlight. Let's say you have a person and the sun's behind them. Well, then it would meter for the person only. So these last two modes here, we have the partial metering mode and we have the center weighted average. So spot metering, again, circle in the middle. Center weighted average, 
you, we don't get a, a circle here, but think of it as a larger circle covering, you know, a, a bigger area of the middle. And then we have partial metering, which almost disregards the corners. So in, in most of these, it's giving heavy weight to the center. And then the evaluative metering is the entire frame and it just measures according to a uh, formula. And that is the metering modes, which are sets of shapes that tell the camera how to measure and calculate the light that is entering through the lens. Now, if you're trying to maximize the most out of your Canon R6 Mark II, there are some important accessories and investments I'm going to recommend. The most important is right here between your two ears. It's the knowledge of how to use the camera and how that knowledge changes depending on the type of shooting you are doing. Therefore, the number one accessory I recommend is your training in the Canon R6 Mark II crash course. That link is in the description. If you're interested, let us know. We will send you a link as soon as it's available. You're probably going to want to buy a good tripod. Try to stay away from these cheapy Walmart tripods that you can get for 40 or $50. A good tripod typically starts around $100, and the really good ones are about three to $400. I personally use the Bogan Manfrotto tripods. They have a version called the B-Free. Some are made out of aluminum. Some are made out of carbon fiber. I'm a big fan of the carbon fiber ones, but those are three and $400. There are some lower end tripods you can find, but at least find a tripod where you can swap the head on top of it because it's going to allow you to put different accessories. I personally like a ball head. If you are coming from a Canon DSLR and you have existing lenses, you are definitely going to want to invest into an EF to RF adapter. There's different versions of these. This is the control ring one. It's about $200. There's a more basic one that costs about $99. This will allow us to use our EF lenses onto our mirrorless RF mounts. It's a great investment. Talking about lenses, I have a few in particular that I'm quite fond of. My general purpose is the 24 to 105 f4. It's an expensive lens, but well worth it. It's super sharp. For my wide angle, I'm using the 14 millimeter to 35 f4. It's pretty affordable in terms of L glass, about 12 to 1300 dollars if you can find it with the rebate. Awesome wide angle lens. For something a little bit more telephoto, I recommend the 70 to 200 2.8, also super expensive, but this is top-notch quality glass. And if you're looking for a high-end telephoto zoom, you're looking at the 100 to 500 RF. I own it, I just use it on Safari, it was awesome. If you are on a budget, however, take a look at the 100 to 400 variable aperture. I just bought my second copy of it because when I was on Safari, somebody I was teaching decided to, they were so happy with it, they just decided to buy it off me and I said, yeah, I'll get another one when I come home. If you're looking for some more affordable type lenses, definitely take a look at the 50 millimeter 1.8 RF, anywhere from 200 to $250. There's also a 16 millimeter 2.8 if you're looking for an affordable wide angle lens. If you do any kind of serious video work, you are going to need to invest into some quality microphones. I am speaking to you on a lav mic. I use the Journeyman B3, I think it's called. And I also use the Sennheiser E100 lav packs. A setup like this is gonna cost you close to $1,000 with shipping and tax. Now, if you're doing general purpose videography, you're just going to need a standard onboard microphone. We have put a ton of time and research into developing this. You can get the Maven mic for $50. It's not necessary to spend three, $400 for a general purpose microphone unless you know you're gonna get really serious about this. If you're testing the waters, go with the Maven mic, save yourself a ton of money. Many of you at some point or another are going to get into landscape photography or you're going to start doing strobe use. If you need high speed, high quality filters, check out my Maven brand, Magnetic Filters. We just launched these on Kickstarter. I will put a link for these in the description as well. If you're looking for a great community to share your R6 Mark II images, if you have questions and need feedback, Check out my Facebook group. It's for the R5, R6, and R6 Mark II. We have a great group of users there. Check us out on Facebook, and I hope to see you there. Thank you so much for watching this first part of the Canon R6 Mark II free tutorial on YouTube. Part two is coming. This will cover the deep menu section. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.